folks, we are moving on to Lecture 7 today on Social and Political Thought. And um, it's titled, The Best Ideas Never Die. If you've uh, had a chance to see the educators already, you will know where that's from. Okay, let's go ahead and get started today. Okay, so what we're going to do today is we're going to explore another area of value theory. Just like we uh, discussed value theory through feminist philosophy in um, the section before last, we are now going to discuss another aspect of value uh, theory through social and political thought. Now, it's a subset of value theory because it involves evaluative judgments. Uh, when we talk about politics, we're often bringing in human ideas and human values about good versus evil, justice, right versus wrong, uh, moral components that have an essentially evaluative or subjective element. And so they're going to have to fall under a um, uh, less theoretical, or purely theoretical, objective branch of philosophy, such as value theory. So in particular, because it's such a broad field, we can talk about philosophy of law, uh, we can talk about uh, international relations, the philosophy of war. There's so many things that we can discuss in social and political philosophy. What we're going to do is just take a look at one particular example, uh, the subset of social and political philosophy known as Marxist philosophy or Marxism from the philosophy of um, the 19th century German philosopher Karl Marx. We're also going to look at some updates and challenges and modifications to Marxism. And then we're going to see uh, how it is that Marxist thought shows up in the educators. Okay, so let's get started. So what is social and political thought? Well, it's a really broad area of research, as I've suggested already, uh, and it has to include evaluations of all different aspects of social life. Uh, the phrase, the personal is the political, comes to mind here. Anything of which we can say, this has political influence or this has political salience in my mind. Uh, uh, questions about nationhood, the nation state, voting, racism and voting laws, all of these things, international relations, um, the whole gamut of social life from the family to reproductive rights to, um, to personal uh, issues as well. Now, if we look at the history in Western philosophy, we can find the early antecedents of social and political thought in Plato's questions about the just state or what model governance ought to look like um, in the Republic when he uh, wrote that in 5th century BC. So we find their questions about what the ideal state, the republic, the ideal nation state, ought to look like. Uh, who would rule the ideal nation state? Would it be the most uh, well-educated persons? Would it be the most powerful? Should it be men or women? Should it be one, uh, a monarchy, or should it be uh, many, a uh, democracy? So all of those questions were sort of etched out and formulated in a systematic way in the Republic. Um, and then in the Middle Ages, those social and political questions really were not as formally articulated in philosophy. They were certainly in politics and in uh, monarchies. But they sort of came back into fashion after the Enlightenment in Europe. Why? Because the Enlightenment really started all the great sort of political revolutions in Europe, right? Questions about uh, democracy and, and what a nation state should be. Remember that most nation states did not become nation states uh, until after the Enlightenment or the 18th century in Europe. So if we look in particular in philosophy, we can look to the work of Immanuel Kant, who wrote treatises like Perpetual Peace, or essays called What is Enlightenment? And in those essays, he once again systematically uh, asked about not just the role of the state, but now the relationship between the individual um, and the nation state. In other words, 
what kind of individual? We are rational beings after the scientific revolution and the enlightenment. If we're rational beings endowed with freedom, who have a responsibility to sort of uh, make a state our own, right? This is a call for revolution. Uh, citizens have a, a duty to kind of defend the nation state or the homeland uh, under this model because of a certain set of civic beliefs. So if that's the case, what is the relationship between an individual endowed with reason and human freedom and political responsibility and the nation state to which one uh, does belong or potentially belongs? Um, and this was really influential because a lot of philosophers started to focus after the, rebel, the political revolutions and the upheavals in Western Europe, start to really focus in particular on social political thought. Whereas before, you were really considering, after the medieval period, questions of metaphysics and epistemology, right? What is the nature of man? What is the nature of the world? And so the focus uh, really had to come back after certain social conditions on the ground made it possible to start thinking really closely and paying attention to political questions in particular. And this is a context out of which certain uh, thinkers and economists, such as Adam Smith and David Ricardo, uh, working in, in uh, Britain, were theorizing political theories, uh, political philosophies, based, of course, on economic principles, about the nature of, of the world. And out of that matrix comes the thought of Karl Marx. Um, so all of these sort of conditions allowed the work of 19th century political philosophers to emerge as a really consistent and systematic set of interrelated ideas that were in conversation with one another. What I don't want you to think, I don't want you to get the picture of Marxism as just this um, sort of uh, aberrant idea or an anomaly, that, uh, this very strange or uh, genius type of, of new idea of somebody that wanted to talk about uh, ideas of communism. It's very consistent with the politics of the time and it's extremely interrelated to the larger conversations about the nation state and um, the relation to society and civic life that were happening at the time. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So let's get an overview now of Karl Marx. Once again, German philosopher, had a PhD in philosophy, educated in, in, um, in philosophy, but also very, very interested in understanding um, the nature of the world in particular ways. So because he was trained as a philosopher, philosophers want to know what the condition for the possibility of anything is, right? In other words, what is the basis, the assumptions, the sets of ideas, the prejudgments that make it possible for me to understand something as such, for me to take in the world in the ways that I do, right? Can we uncover and lay bare the set of assumptions or underlying claims that make it possible for me to understand my world in the particular way that I do? So this is the kind of interpretive lens, the looking glasses that Karl Marx had on when he was looking at his world. And it just so happens that everything that he's going to do is going to kind of be answered by this, this way of looking at the world. He's going to look at the world and say, okay, what, what is the fundamental sort of nature in the world? What are the conditions under which the world shows up in the way that it does? Now, for, um, for Plato, that was a metaphysical answer, right? That was the world of forms. For Descartes, whom we studied, what's the answer going to be? Right? A mind, an immaterial mind, the, the cogiton, the res cogiton. Now, for Marx, he's going to give us a kind of materialist answer. He's going to say it's economics. It's an economic theory. The forces that govern the world, so a physicist would answer what, right? The, the laws of physics, the governing dynamics of a mechanical universe. And instead of that, he's going to say 
the things that make it possible for us to perceive the world in the ways that we do, to take it in in the ways that we do as the kind of world that it is, are economic principles. That's it. If you can get that, then, then we're in good shape. Uh, because there's going to be a lot of different key terms and concepts and uh, lots of jargon used in the lecture. And so um, I don't want you to get lost. So the main idea at the end of the day is he's going to look at the world and say, what is it that makes the world run? What is the engine, the condition for the possibility of the world showing up in the way that it does? And what's the answer? Economic principles. For Marx, economic principles were the equivalent of Descartes' immaterial mind. It was a kind of transcendent or universal principle, a law like governing dynamics that could systematically explain the nature of the world, where the nature of the world consisted for Marx of social forces. For a physicist, the nature of the world would be what? Like, you know, physical forces, gravity. For a sociologist, kind of like Marx, um, they consisted of social forces. Why do people act the way that they do? Why do uh, bosses and workers fight? Why do we have revolutions? Why do politicians have the interests that they do? Economic forces. Once again, just like Descartes explained, the nature of everything that we perceive in terms of the nature of the immaterial mind, the cogito, um, I think therefore I am, uh, Marx is describing things in terms of economic principles. Right? These are fundamental principles that are grounding at the fundamental base level, permeating everything that belongs to perceptual life. Okay? So, uh, by the end of this lecture, we're going to cover the concept, this is his most famous concepts, of what we call historical materialism. And that's just his view of history. That's just the revolution picture, right? There will be a revolution, and it will be called historical materialism. Uh, in order to explain that theory, he comes up with what we call the economic theory, called the labor theory of value. That's how value is going to be produced in a capitalist society. And to do that, he's going to have to talk about this economic model that involves society, which we're going to call, which is called the superstructure model. And together, that's going to explain his whole picture of um, society as the history of one great big class struggle. Okay, so you may be familiar with this, right? You may be familiar, familiar with the concept of Marx as describing a uh, class struggle. Today, the most uh, by far blatantly kind of uh, neo-Marxist uh, language that we have is the language of the 99% versus the 1%, right? With the sort of Occupy Wall Street. Um, now, you're going to be wondering, if he's describing everything in terms of economics, why is he talking about class or society? Because he talks about economics in order to talk about the world that we do perceive, right? the world that we actually engage with. We don't bump into economic principles. We bump into other people. We talk to other people. We talk about economics with other people. And that's how economics shows up in our world. It shows up through um, labor relations or social organization for people and rich people, people that have money, people that have less money. Um, so make no mistake, even though we're, we'll be talking about class and questions of identity and poverty and politics, all of this is uh, based on the fundamental assumptions that underlie Marxist system are some basic claims, which can be called into question and happen. Um, about the nature of the world uh, based on certain economic principles. Okay, and we're going to make sure that we understand certain keywords: the bourgeois or bourgeoisie, proletariat, uh, the mode of production, sometimes called the forces of production, or the relations of production, and the distinction between that and the means of production, and uh, the alienation of our labor. Okay, um, so you don't have to know those right now. We're going to go through them bit by bit. Okay, 
let's start with the historical context. Why this at that time? We talked a little bit about just the general ideas of the time uh, in philosophy, but to be a little bit more specific, um, the economic and social conditions in mid to late 19th century Britain were just right for this kind of philosophy and the ideas that Marx came up with along with his collaborators like uh, Frederick Engels in Britain. Um, so here's a couple things that were happening. You had the great kind of political revolutions in Europe um, and you also had the Industrial Revolution. Now what happened with the Industrial Revolution? So machines started to replace workers but at a really fast pace. It was a revolution, right? So you didn't have time for labor relations or safety codes to kind of keep up with the fast pace of all the kind of incredible um, uh, revolutions in industry, the mills and, and all of these things. So of course with the rise of all of these mills and the high urbanization and labor rates, there's a great deal of industrial accidents. Um, the mortality rates in urban areas in the 19th century in Europe and especially in Britain and Western Europe were extremely high. If you compare rural to urban mortality rates, they were at least nine or tenfold because mostly of, of factory work, of industrial accidents. And so you can see how there can be a general kind of discontent about uh, things, who's responsible for this. Is it just one person? Is it the worker? Is it the stay? But right? who's responsible for the welfare of, of workers? You have no regulated labor laws. You have no uh, welfare state. You also had absolutely no um, uh, uh, child labor laws. You didn't have the eight hour work day. Uh, you had no regulations, you had very low pay, you had an unregulated, you could be fired at will, extremely long hours. Um, and, and on top of that, you didn't have a sort of, you know, a universal right to vote, uh, sort of disenfranchised on top of that. And so you had a sense that if you were a worker in 19th century Britain, you were extremely aware, perhaps more than you would have been at any other time in Western Europe's history, even as a peasant under feudalism, um, of, of the, not just, uh, I wouldn't say uh, the injustice of the system, but the hardships, that the hardships that you bore uh, were perhaps not worth the cost. And the mortality rates were so high, um, and you were not able to make a, a sort of living wage, uh, along with low sanitation in the cities, uh, you had a situation ripe for, for civic un unrest. You also had in 1848 the great political revolutions right? France, um, uh, Belgium, and Prague, and Vienna. You had lots of civic uh, unrest, in part due to, um, to these issues in industrial, um, in industrial workforce. At the very forefront of political life, you also had the rise of journalism as a, a, a kind of mass media. So you had a kind of popular consciousness. It wasn't just that you saw it in your neighborhood, in the local, at the local mill. It's not that just your family was talking about it. There was now a way for the public consciousness to have a sense that this was happening everywhere and to be able to mobilize on a more mass scale, a sense of injustice or rage uh, about uh, kind of incidents, particularly with children. Children were dying at such high, high rates. Uh, this was very highly kind of publicized. And so politicians began to have to account to get, um, to kind of get, get the vote. Uh, politicians had to begin to address this. It wasn't the forefront of political life. Now, all of this um, could have been answered just with political sort of new rules, right? Maybe a monarchy that institutes new rules. But what happened with the 1848 kind of uh, political upheavals is that Western Europe saw kind of the equivalent of, of mobilization without emancipation. What does that mean? That there was a lot, um, there was a lot of upheaval, a lot of kind of high cost of these 
these wars and, and revolts, but nothing really seemed to, to get done. There was no lasting change. And so the purely political or legal model for initiating change started to not just fall out of favor, but philosophers like Karl Marx started to rethink, okay, so, so if, if politics alone, if laws, for instance, if laws or uh, the legal branch of politics or the judicial branch is not enough to be able to theorize our way to a better situation, what is really driving everything? And that's what kind of gave him the, the incentive to say there's something even more underlying here. It's economic principles that no matter how many laws we have, um, we may have laws that ban, for instance, child labor, but you're still going to have unscrupulous kind of uh, work at bosses, excuse me, unscrupulous bosses, they're going to be paying child, children under the table in order to maximize profit, to become wealthy. So it, as a philosopher, he wanted to know what, what are the governing dynamics for this kind of, of greed, right? What is this, what is this pursuit of, of wealth? What does it look like at, at um, the broad level? Um, and, and from that, can we then initiate political change? But first we need to understand the underlying uh, economic principles that are going to continue to drive the conditions under which these kinds of um, uh, situations occur. Okay, so now let's take a look at some key terms, okay? These are the key terms that we're going to slowly uh, be using to build up our vocabulary for understanding Marx's system of historical materials. Now, some of these you know very well, okay? So, according to Karl Marx, the history of society is the history of class struggle, okay? The history of society is a history of class struggle. What does that mean? That means he saw the world as divided into really two halves. And the thing that divided it was the category of class. Now later on, we're going to wonder, well, are there more categories? Why this category? Is this category enough to theorize the complexity of social relations? But suffice it to say that if it's the case that it's the economy that he thought was driving everything in society, and the economy really shows up in terms of value and money, some have it, some don't, that's kind of what, what is it that makes us a class, right? Who has money, who, has, who doesn't have money? And so um, the history of society is then therefore divided into two halves. Uh, two different classes of society, and they're not mutually exclusive. In other words, you can belong to one class and rise up to the other, and you can belong to the higher class and then fall out of favor, become poor, and rise to the other. One class is called the bourgeoisie. These are French words. The bourgeoisie or bourgeoise class. And the bourgeoisie are the capitalists. They are the rich people, the money-making people, the ones that that uh, earn and invest uh, the profit based on the, uh, the workers' labor. And who are the workers? Those are called the proletariat. Whenever you hear the, somebody being called a pro or a proli, that uh, comes from proletariat. Those are just the workers. That's the 99%, right? Um, and so their goal, of course, is they want to have high wages, right, for the least amount of labor. And the capitalists, or the bourgeoisie, bourgeois, want to maximize profit and pay the least amount of labor. And they create two different classes. There's the working class and then the capitalist class. Um, and, of course, there's degrees, right? As you're ascending up a scale, you can have upper middle class. and But nonetheless, um, there are these uh, sort of general general categories, okay? All right, now, according to, to Marx, um, these two classes meet, right? These two, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, come together through what he called relations of production. At work, right? When you're producing stuff, you gotta come together, you gotta relate. You gotta relate to one another in order to get stuff done, to, to produce stuff. 
So relations of production are just simply when you're thrown uh, together into a work situation for the purpose of producing profit, whether it's a product or at some point that that has value, right? Whether it's a charity or uh, it's still relations of, of production. There's a way to value. There's always a way to, to assess a value, even if it's not a strict monetary value. But there's always a way to assess value. And those relations of production, according to Marx, are what form the fundamental base, that's the foundation of society. Um, and so you have, of course, the example, you know, office space, great movie. Um, you have a different classes. You may think, well, that's middle management or, but essentially you have different classes of society coming together for the purposes of uh, uh, relations of production. Uh, you have the famous Domino's ads, or all the pizza ads, in which you have this very same setup where you have the, either the Papa John's or the Domino's CEO come and check out the, uh, the, the you know, working conditions and, and make a pizza with the workers. Uh, but make no mistake, they are, they are two distinct uh, uh, classes on this model. Okay, so they come together to produce uh, a, a profit. Now, that actually looks like something very, very particular because that needs to have a goal. We could all just be sitting around at work um, just, you know, taking it easy, smoking pot, or I'm not saying, you know, not advocating this in any way, but uh, one could be absolutely wasting time and not doing anything, right? Not producing anything. So it's really important that relations of production are always informed by a goal. You've got to have a goal. And that goal is to produce surplus value. Okay, so what's surplus value? Surplus value is just profit, right? It's when you actually have a, a, a profit. So uh, this is in the simplest, simplest sense. Let's say you started a business, right? You need a startup cost, right? You need X amount of money to either pay your, the workers or get materials, uh, a staff business, whatever it is. And um, whatever you earn after you accounted for payroll and all of that, we call your profit, right? That's, that's surplus value. Now, well, so why not just call it that, right? Why not just call it, describe it in that way? Because the emphasis in surplus value is, Marx wants to say, okay, make no mistake, the thing that actually does the earning, the thing that produces the wealth, is the worker's labor. It's your labor. It's not, that, it's not the fact that you manage to sell X amount of units and after the fact of paying all your workers, you earned X amount of money. That's not what the value, that's not what produces value. So you actually have to first extract value from your workers, right? You have to you have to make them work. You have to do right. This is why when we meet someone, we don't we tend to say, "What do you do?" Because we want to know what their labors were, right? Um, we don't say, "Are you?" Hi, my name is so and so, and the first question we ask is not generally, um, you know, what are your dreams, hopes, and aspirations, and are you content with life? So um, we produce this through particular, through the extraction of workers' labor. And of course, the capitalist ca uh, class wants to extract their most amount of labor for the least amount of wages. And the proletariat wants to uh, produce the least amount of labor, right? You don't want to be breaking your back uh, for the most amount of wages. You want a high paying job, you want a good paying job. And so what is this going to do? This creates conflict, right? This is this is it, there's a tension. There's a fundamental tension in terms of economic interests uh, of labor relations, and this conflict can, of course, be mitigated through races, through promotion, things. But the but for Marx, the fundamental kind of economic basis of conflict is there at the kind of structural level. Okay, so. <clears throat> So you produce value. Now, according to Marx, uh, you, need, uh, you need human labor to produce it. But labor, um, 
labor alone, right? You can't just generally do it. You generally need also need things in life. So how are we going to actually produce it? What kinds of now we have to talk about not just working, but all the different kinds of work. How do we know what kinds of jobs we have in a capitalist system? And remember, for all of this, this is important. Here, Marx is describing um, a kind of a capitalist system, how value is produced under a capitalist system, okay? A capitalist economic social organization. When societies organize themselves, around an economic model based on the production of capital or wealth, this is what it's going to, to look like. So what are you going to need? Um, now it's it's funny because when you close your eyes and you think all the possible jobs that one can have in a capitalist system, it seems endless, right? So it's not about the particular, um, it's not about just identifying particular jobs. It's identifying the fact that that somebody can right, uh, pay for that service or that it's something that's needed in society. And so the thing that holds true is really the production of labor, the production of those jobs. So according to Marx, he distinguished between the means of production and the mode of production. And this is going to relate to the two different classes in society. Now, the means of production is really simple. That's just all the stuff you need, all the things that you need to produce the necessities of life in a society. That's just the raw material. That's just the stuff that means so that you don't die, right? So uh, in, in this sort of caveman uh, picture, it's a caveman uh, that needs to gather something, right, to feed themselves or shelter, all the raw material. And you're going to need to, to input a certain amount of labor, right? You're going to have to use your hands or shape that tool or do something to produce that kind of, of value. And that's going to, um, in different societies, you have different materials. Some societies are, are rich in core or copper or some societies don't have very many natural resources. And, and of course, that's going to determine the kinds of things that you can make, right? So how do you then go about putting stuff together? You have no machinery, you're going to do things by hand. But how you go about producing products so well, that's just a code called the mode of production, right? Whether it's manual labor or mass machinery, that's just the mode. Now, under capitalism, whoever owns um, the kind of mode of production, the machinery, is going to be the party of uh, the party in power, right? Whoever is able to control the means by which stuff is produced, the plants, the mills, uh, is going to really be the class in power in society. And that can that can change depending on, on societies. But uh, that's just the basic setup. Now the thing that Marx says is really interesting about capitalism is that um, it always tries to revolutionize the mode of production. Uh, and this is why technology is extremely important under capitalism. Sometimes it's so important that it revolutionizes it for just revolutionary sake, right? That you have to always change the mode of production for efficiency, even if it may not seem in the best interest or a uh, uh, society. So if you look at cell phones, right, we can see how they've been uh, revolutionized. But um, think of some gadgets now that are, I uh, think of the miniaturization of cell phones or other gadgets. And sometimes we've, we've come across um, in the news uh, uh, miniaturized uh, electronic devices. It seems so small that it almost sort of defeat the purpose, right? Then we go back to a bigger, um, because the attempt to, to it's just a kind of buzz light ear onwards and forwards, blindly thinking it's revolutionizing the mode of production for the sake of revolutionizing the mode of production. That's something that Marx says is just kind of inherent to uh, capitalism. You're going to have to keep on doing it to keep pace. I mean, you can't keep pace. So it's not so much that what's driving the demand is the actual need for a tinier or a smaller, it's just an example a tinier or a smaller device. It's 
the fact that at our at the heart of our economic system, that's what we do, and so that's that's what shows up, and it's what we think we know to want: smaller, better, faster. Uh, whereas sometimes smaller, it's it's impossible to hold with you know uh, opposable thumbs or the kinds of of hands that we have or the ergonomic you know um, design of our bodies. Um, so that's the mode of production. Okay, so let's see how this all comes together. So according to, to Marx, this is his, his view of, of uh, society and, and history. According to Marx, society, human society, is organized um, a lot based on fundamental economic principles that have to do with the ways in which we produce stock, in which we make the necessities of life. If uh, cavemen or prehistoric peoples produced the necessities of life with their bare hands, um, in uh, the Middle Ages, you produce the necessities of life by employing serfs or slaves, or um, today with the factory, and how it is they produce these necessities of life is going to determine the organizing structure of your society. So really everything before mechanized labor um, is, is going to be on this like shady space of pre-capitalism, right? The dark ages. There are these, these um, appearance of, of what he'll call primitive accumulation. It's kind of like the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, prehistoric ages. We're just we're kind of like getting to know the lay of the land. We're acquiring, we're, we're building maps, we're understanding the kinds of resources at our disposal. We're discovering spices in, in India, and we're charting the land, and we're uh, exploring oceans and discovering, quote unquote, worlds. Um, we're trying to understand the nature of the stuff that's out there so that we then know what to do with it or what we can possibly do with it and then build machines to revolutionize or to put things to to use the cotton spool, the mill, the uh, wheat grain uh, mills and, and so forth. And so after this period of, of accumulation, you, according to Marx, you proceed naturally. So this is something that's going to happen. This is a, a, a developmental picture of history based on economics. So you start with just raw materials, and then there comes a point in a society, according to Marx, that you start to kind of make stuff, to make stuff, right? You can't just use your hands. You start to make uh, a wheel for trans uh, transportation that will transport the grain to the silo and so forth. You make instruments. You, uh, you industrialize. You build machines and industries for producing things. And that is the crucial step. You need to go through that period of, of building an infrastructure, plants, right? This is like the Model T, the Henry Ford. You need to build stuff to make stuff in order to produce um, a wealth, a surplus wealth like this. Uh, and to build the infrastructure society. So after industrialization, that's when you have a capitalist uh, system. Now, industrialization naturally develops, according to Marx, into a capitalist system. So he's like, all societies kind of have to go through capitalism. I know this is weird. Most of you thought that you know Marx would never say this, but if you actually look at his system, he's just telling you, remember, it's economics. Marx equals economics. Marx equals economics. It's not a value theory in terms of a social moral thing, right? Marx is just giving you this look. He's an economist saying, what is the nature of the world? What the nature of the world begins with this economic stage, and it develops into this economic stage, and then it develops into this economic stage. And when you start to make stuff with tools, you're gonna, this is not naturally going to happen. But, he says, but something's going to happen. He says, the nature of capitalism is that it actually is going to hold some internal contradictions. It's going to eventually collapse. 
Capitalism cannot sustain itself in the long run. He's like, of course it can sustain itself at first, and in fact it has to, and that's what's going to follow from industrialization. Um, but it will eventually collapse, he says in capital. Capitalist production begets with the inexorability, that means you can't change it, of a natural process, its own negation. He looks at this with the same law-like regularity as Plato looked at forms, as Newton looked at physical laws, as Descartes. Uh, looked at, at uh, laws of the immaterial mind. And so capitalism, according to Marx, will breed its own negation. There are going to be internal contradictions that will yield its sort of uh, a fall, the rise and fall of capitalism. And then he realized that out of this, a next economic stage will come. And these are, of course, getting better and better and better. So Marx thought that capitalism was better than industrialization and pre-capitalism. But there are some, some kind of horrible things that can happen, such as industrial accidents um, and uh, unregulated workforce, um, child labor, um, that will yield to a uh, kind of more socially conscious and better economic system um, that he called communism. Now, it's important to note uh, that Marx did not specify the exact nature of what communism would look like because it would have to be unique to the society, to the means and modes of production that were in place in the society from which it emerged. So there's basic tenets that have to be in place that emerge out of the contradictions of capitalism. But the exact, so it's not like etched in stone, it's not, we've never had this, this is important. When we think of Soviet era communism, Stalin and Mussolini and Soviet uh, rule, that is not communism in terms of Marxist thought. We've never truly had Marxist, some would argue that perhaps, you know, in mid-century uh, Chile there was a, a close attempt, but, um, but we've never had um, um, a kind of communist system in terms of the Marxist sense. Uh, we've had kind of totalitarian Soviet era uh, styled quote unquote communism with Mao Zedong. But make no mistake, that's not Marxism in the way that Marx envisioned it, okay? So how is it? So now you want to know, okay, well, what are these internal contradictions? Okay, well, Marx said he called it, and he really did call it at one point, his kind of cannibalistic competition. He's like, look, um, this, this kind of, un the thing about capitalism is that because it, it is simply trying, the capitalist class is simply trying to maximize surplus value, but they don't know why. They're simply pursuing it, like technology for technology's sake. They're simply boldly, forwardly trying to ma maximize profits at all costs. And they're not asking why or how or for what purpose. There is no stopgap. There is no, um, at X point, we'll certain that's enough money, right? Uh, when the company gets big enough, that's when. That seems to be enough profit for the company because it is based on a, on an economic view of unfettered growth of unrestrained or uh, uncapped growth, um, it's going to create a kind of competition where in order to do that, he says one capitalist is just going to try to strike down many others. And in the process, it's going to be the seeds of its own destruction. Because you're going to start to put your uh, your competitors out of business, so it's not. So at first, you put the small, you know, the small town bookstore out of business, the small mom and pop shop. But eventually, you take out the big ones. You take out so Borders, right? Was was kind of taken over, and Barnes and Noble, and now you have Amazon, and now you're done. Um, this model is where you have this kind of, of, of just abstracted out competition. Uh, you have, you know, linens and things, and then Bed Bath & Beyond takes over that. And so even uh, a sort of, um, we can say, well, that's just, you know, the best survive kind of unfair competition. But Marx is saying, actually, no, that's not what's, what's happening, isn't it? 
uh, they're going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And there's going to be a point where the biggest firms are the ones that are going to go out of out of business or going to collapse because there is no there is no economic internal regulation. This is not a political or legal claim. There's, it's not like there's no regulators coming in and regulating things. There's not any economic principle built into capitalism in order to be able to have the foundation to self-regulate. So you're going to have a Lehman Brothers. You're going to have something that is, that is too big to fail, um, so to speak. Let's take a look at another example here. So, so what's going to happen is that the capitalists, according to Marx, are going to naturally compete with each other. That's just the nature of producing value. You have to compete for workers, right, for resources to produce value. And of course, the successful ones get richer and richer, and then the successful ones will fall down to the working class. But then this will start to happen at a larger and larger scale. So it's okay at a period after Industrial Revolution, post-war eras, when we produced a lot of stuff, there's a lot of jobs, and the economy's getting bigger and richer, and everyone's getting richer, and that's fine. But what will start to happen is more and more upper middle class, right? More and more of the capitalists will start to fall. And that class of workers is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's not just going to get bigger. They're going to get poorer and poorer. They're going to be, it's going to be even more difficult to meet the basic subsistence because you don't have the same type of capitalist class sustaining the workers. And so Marx says this is just something that's built into the economic principles. You're going to have a, a situation of a, a kind of boiling point uh, where you will have a general, a general revolt. And um, uh, this is what will lead to, to calls for, uh, for change, right, for regulation, for justice, for the large majority of, of uh, workers, for workers' rights, for jobs, for um, uh, the restraint of unfettered growth and capitalist greed, okay? So, uh, and at that point, that's, this is the proletarian revolution. That's when the workers, a little pros revolt. That's proletarian revolution. And um, sometimes it's the case that, um, so, so, okay, let me say this. It's all of these are important and necessary stages. It has, it's just determined in advance. This is, it's a kind of structural developmental history. It's just like in biology, the development of a, of a, a biological organism from like zygote to it's just a general developmental picture and so the role of the workers at the stage of they're going to be so dissatisfied that they're going to take to the streets and they're going to begin a kind of ideological kind of rabble rousing or consciousness raising this is the workers of the world tonight they are going to have a role in bringing about this revolutionary change, this proletarian revolution, by pointing out these very contradictions in capitalism. Now, why would you need to do that? Well, because if it's, if it's unseen economic principles that we're largely unaware of that are driving all of the different kind of, of um, push-pull mechanisms in our social world, if we don't see them, they're going to have to be kind of made known to us or called to our attention. They're going to have to be brought to the forefront. So there becomes, there, there, um, there exists an important ideological function for workers in proletarian revolution uh, to raise the consciousness and to educate one another about the nature of these economic forces that are um, uh, underlying the nature of our social world and social relations, but which remain by and large hidden to us, okay? So that's his view of history, marching forward towards revolution. So what makes all of this happen, <clears throat> okay? So let's, now we're going to talk about these, these economic forces, right? Let's, now we're going to say, okay, so so let's say somebody comes and says, all right, uh, so according to Marx, this is, this is now where we're at, it's economic forces that are really shaping or driving um, all of our social relations. So you can say, okay, well, tell me about it, explain that to me. 
So the first thing Marx is going to say, he's going to say, okay, it's kind of like this. This is, this is, these are the economic forces at play. And here's kind of what it looks like, okay? And he's going to call it the base superstructure model. Now, in order to explain himself, he's going to say, all right, well, picture this. It's kind of like, like a house, the top of a house and the foundation of the base of a house. First, have the superstructure or the structure of society, right? That's the world we live in, the super on top. It's the structure on top, right? So the superstructure is the structure of society where we actually live. It's a social organization of class. Um, it's made up of, um, of a society, of, of schools, of laws, of politics. It's the world we live in. And then, of course, there is other thing that holds it up, and that's the base. The foundation of society. And the foundation of society is kind of the unseen economic engine that we all want to know about that's driving all of the forces and politics and laws and conflicts um, and shopping patterns and entertainment and social relations and in the superstructure. So society is once again made up of two halves. It's one we see and experience and one we don't. But the one that we don't is the one that actually holds up and informs the world that we do see. So let's take a closer look. Okay? So it's kind of like a triangle. On top is the superstructure, right? So let's take a look at the superstructure first. So the super superstructure, once again, is the world we live in. It's our education. So going to school. So right now you're in the superstructure. Listening to this lecture is part of the superstructure. You have your family, right? Our economic relations uh, sh uh, shape the family? Oh, absolutely, right? Um, is education shaped by economic forces? Oh, absolutely. What school you can afford, how many credits you can take, what classes you choose to take, what degrees that you choose to take, what you think will be more profitable. I mean, who wants to major in philosophy, right? The question is, what are you going to do with that? What, what surplus value can you produce with that? Um, and uh, uh, is religion shaped by economic forces? Think of the organized religion or the institutionalized church or the Catholic church or, um, or any other church. Uh, sure, absolutely. Mass media and politics, all of these are shaped by economic forces. Um, and the political power structures are important to uh, also the structures of the state. Uh, all the rules and rituals, entertainment, what one can and can't afford, uh, what kind of songs get put, and why do why are certain songs uh, created? Even though one think that's just a crappy song, like who came up with that? Uh, what was that Rebecca Black Friday or something? Or who, what, what? How is that music? How is this? Well, because we say there's a demand for it, and really, what Marx would say is that that these are the economic principles underlying uh, the need to create this kind of surplus uh, value. It's a type of, of, of value for the sake of producing uh, this value. So the superstructure, so to be clear, that's the world that we interact with, right? And economic principles shape that, but we don't actually bump into those. Like you can't see that. You can't poke or prod or touch or shake the hand of an economic principle, right? It has to be experienced through an institution, through something, through the fact that you can't pay your rent or you have to pay um, the registrars or uh, your, your phone bill or things like that, okay? Now, holding that up is the base. And the base is made up of two parts, okay? The first part we talked about, that's just the relations of production, right? We talked about the relations of production. That's how we come together and, and work. So you got to go to work, and you got to work with other people in particular ways to make money in order to pay your bills and to pay your tuition bill, right, or to get a scholarship. And even, uh, but even more fundamentally, it means that are the forces of production uh, or the means of production sometimes uh, called or referred to the means. I think it's a, because I think it's a little bit confusing to call it the means of production. I think it's easier to call it the forces of production. So you don't get it confused with the means of production and the modes of production, right? Remember, the means of production are all the things that you need to produce um, the basic necessities of, of, of life, okay? So, um, 
So the means or the forces of production is just basically it's all the raw materials and all the stuff that you need to actually produce wealth. So think of it. Think of it this way. At the very, very foundation, you have a society that, that has you live on top of earth, right? On top of actual, you know, we're talking very basic. You, you uh, soil. You're you're living on soil, and the soil has certain nutrients, has certain resources, and and uh, we can mine uh, certain natural resources to produce certain kinds of things, but not others. We can harvest uranium. We can do certain things with natural resources. And depending on where we live, that's restricted. So that's the forces of production. And depending on that, if we are a country that's very rich in particular thing, like uh, grains or food, if we're in California, what are the relations in California or Texas going to produce, going to look like if, um, if you are primarily an agricultural state? So California is, has really rich soil for producing, growing everything. Most of our produce is going to come from California and some Florida too, right? So what, is those, what do those relations look like? They're mostly labor, right? Think of all the, the issues with immigration in California, the relations of production, the jobs, the kinds of jobs that you have in California are going to be shaped by, by the forces of production. It's, it's what you have and how, how you're going to shape what you have. Um, and that's not the case in New York City or Manhattan. Um, so here's another... So then the question is, okay, so you have the base, and that's stuff you don't see, but but all of that is going to shape the kind of family you have, the kind of housing, the kind of religion, the politics that you have. All of these are the economic principles that are going to shape the kind of life that emerges. So how do the two interact? Okay? So now we put them together. Okay, we put them together, we put the superstructure on top of the base, and this is our kind of our attempt to draw this out for you, uh, but I didn't like it drawing so um, so I tried to use a diagram too uh, but they're the same thing essentially I tried to put so you could picture like you know the different levels so you have the, the relations of production it's kind of like the basement of the house you don't see it you don't see the fuse box but you need it to to you can actually go to work so you actually have some engagement with it you know eventually if something goes wrong you have to go down to the basement and then there's the forces of production, that's the soil, that's the foundation that holds up the house. If you have no foundation, the house will, will tumble. So how do they interact? Well, according to Marx, um, the superstructure and the base both inform and shape, I think this is a term legitimizes, but they both inform and shape each other. They need each other. Without a base, the house doesn't stand. And the house only stands because there's a base. Um, so if the house gets too heavy in some senses, it affects you know foundations or um, so they mutually interact. They they go back and forth. They shape, they inform, they maintain, they legitimize the base, and they do that through what Marx called ideology. Ideology. Okay. So once again, how do they interact? How does the superstructure? Because remember, we can't see it. We can't see it. So um, through our ideas, right? Think about it this way. Um, if um, if you are getting a degree and you want a business and you want to excuse me major in business administration, it's uh, because you think it will produce uh, profit, right? It will produce particular. Maybe you have. I would. I would hope it's because you have an kind of unfettered love of um, uh, the management of, or the micromanagement, either of of minute uh, details and organizational principles and running of business meetings and producing memorandums. If you have a beautiful industrial design and producing memorandums and you know it's your passion and you want to major in business or marketing because of it, then um, that's, that tends not to be the case. It's not mutually exclusive, but it tends to be because you have an idea, you have a particular picture of how much you will earn. It's informed or driven by unseen ideas or economic principles about what profit or labor should look like or what equals a good, a good life, where a good life is one that is free from want, right? It is free from 
the absence. It is uh, one that is maximally filled with the absence of one, and you can have the most amount of power, where power equals purchasing power. Okay. So once again, how do we interact through ideas or ideology? Now, ideology is actually a formal term, and let's take a look at it. Okay, so ideology. The basic premise of ideology is that at any, in, at any time in a society's history, um, they, they kind of remember it's always made up of two classes for Marx. The, the ruling class is going to have the prevailing idea. The ideas of the time uh, are going to be the, the ones of the class in power. And this is not, don't think of like a master puppeteer or an evil class looking down over a, a master class over a slave class. Don't think of it. But in terms of the, we take up the values of one particular class. In other words, do poor people want to stay poor? Generally speaking, they aspire to be rich. Do rich people want to be poor? Generally speaking, they aspire to stay rich. Okay, now you may say, well, duh, this is the case, but this is just the most, it's, it's about as, as reductive an example as I, I can give of ideology, right? So the idea here is that it's an, it's an uncritical assumption because we have not fully philosophically questioned the merit of wealth or poverty as a, 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 a role in living a good life or a good human life or a life well lived. Think here, for instance, of ascetic principles of monks, of Buddhists, where, where uh, you, don't, you, you don't aspire to be rich or you, don't have, you have an asceticism. So the idea that there's an inherent universal good to be gained from, from um, just the accumulation or the acquisition of wealth, that rich equals good, is an uncritical assumption. Now, after careful investigation, one can still come to that conclusion and affirm that indeed that is something that is good. Or we can qualify it as it is good in cases A, B, C, and D, but not in these cases. But what tends to happen is that because of ideology, it's just it's something that just generally happens. There's no master puppeteer, no one's involved. It's just something that it just shape. It's like the motor, right? It just it's running. It's like the AC in the house. It, is it possible to hear? Yeah, it's possible. But for the most part, you kind of forget. You, you there's a point at which you stop hearing hearing the AC running, but you still feel its effects, right? You still feel that its effects, and you also feel when it's not there, particularly in Florida. You like turn it back on. And so you see here, for example, one of the best examples is the Che Guevara T-shirt, right? Is that the forces uh, of capitalism are so strong in ideology is that everything gets reabsorbed back into the dominant ideology. So Che Guevara, we'll talk about him in a moment, uh, was a, a strong proponent of Marx and Marxism in his own way. Um, and of course, he would not agree with capitalism or with the production of value or the selling of, of goods or his image through profit or in, in a t-shirt. Um, and so, of course, the way that the ruling ideology reappropriates that, right, is, well, then just slap it on, sell it on something, right? It now becomes reabsorbed or reappropriated. And so, um, so in this way, social control, and, and um, don't think of it, again, I don't want you to think of like an evil master puppeteer. Certainly, you can have aspects of that with, with Stalinism, and, but again, that's not communism, that's not Marxism in the classical sense. Um, so social control in a capitalist society um, is, is achieved through ruling class ideology. And so how do we then engage with it? Well, through the superstructure, through media, education, family. Like how do you know to want an iPod? Or how do you know to um, uh, want a particular kind of car? Or how do you know what kind of degree to get? Right? Are you influenced by your family? Sure. Uh, by your professor? Sure. All these different things. So it's possible under this picture of ideology that along with being kind of alienated um, from, from your labor, and all of this means, how many of you just are absolutely, I mean, just love going to work? 
in, in, in a kind of robust sense, particularly if you work a serving job, or how many of you feel, maybe you do enjoy it because of your colleagues, or maybe you have a great kind of atmosphere, but how many of you feel like you are producing something that is only you can give, that is unique to you, right? That, that you are producing value that only you can produce, that you're not replaceable, that you're producing like something unique, that your labor is unique and not replaceable. It's in this sense that you're alienated from the labor, right? So along with being alienated, the working class, according to Marx, may also suffer from what we we'll call a false consciousness. And that's to say, not really understanding their true class position because it's too easy to get be absorbed. You live in a superstructure. I mean, think about it this way. Are you aware of the house that you live in while you're living in it? Right? Are you aware of the walls, the fact that there are walls or that you're sitting in a room? Or for the most part, you're in the classroom and you forget that you're in the classroom. You're listening to this lecture. Or uh, how many of you were cognizant of the fact that when you, you were using a laptop at that very second? Or um, you, it kind of goes into the background, right? And so what happens is that we're not aware of our class position because there are mechanisms in the superstructure, namely commercial goods or um, the practice of consumption um, and the accumulation of goods that allow us to be distracted from or allow us to kind of fill the void. We, we buy shit all the time, right? We call it retail therapy. We're having a bad day. We go buy a new dress or there's a new Halo game out and we want that and we're distracted for another good, you know, that'll give us a good week at least. And, um, or uh, uh, the, the latest movie is out or, um, um, and, and we look at these as inherent goods and they may be, they may, they may be, but for the most part, what uh, tends to happen according to Marx is that they are uncritical assumptions, right? So remember, Marx doesn't say these things are inherently bad or evil, um, is that they are, they are part and parcel of an economic system that is built in such a way that it makes it almost impossible for the human individual to be making true free autonomous choices. That what you know to, and what he wants is human freedom. He wants you to be free to make your choices. And so in many ways, um, uh, uh, one thing that you want, like we eat at the same restaurants, we, eat, we do the same kinds of things, and Marx would want one to want something out of their own sort of volition. And it's increasingly difficult to do that when the things that we know to want are created, manufactured, sustained, produced, and legitimated by a very tightly uh, lattice and inner working or interlaced network of ideas and assumptions that are highly, highly compatible with ruling class ideology. What is that? The maximization of profit and the production of wealth. So, in other words, could one get all these things that we like to do without spending money? Could we do it? Could we achieve the same ends without producing? So, under this model, um, maybe not going to a movie, but watching a free movie, right, on the lawn. Um, in many ways, what we want is the experience, right? Ex the experience of the per uh, that is that cannot be disconnected from the commercial transaction, and that's the key. So Marx is saying, look, the things that you think you want are, it, are very difficult to disconnect from the commercial transaction. Um, how many days can you go without buying something? Well, if you're poor, that tends to, you're like, well, I can go a whole week because you have no money. But if you did, right, if you were not cash poor, right, if you did, it, it tends to be very difficult um, to to engage in the activities of life without without that. Um, so that's what ideology is, and it's very powerful because it becomes our personalities. It's it's so when we open our mouths, we don't speak. Ideology speaks us. We say we want, we we desire, we like, we have fun doing this. And really the thing holding it together for Marx is the commercial transaction. So it's in light of this that he writes the Communist Manifesto. Now, it's not a how-to guide. It's been misinterpreted as a how-to manual. Because remember, 
um, according to Marx, all of this is, is, well, we'll get to that in a second. The first thing to remember is that it's co-written with Frederick Engels. And it was written as a kind of, it was kind of commissioned for the Communist League, Communist Party. Um, and so if you remember that, then it's easy to remember why it reads kind of like a program bullet point, da 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 da, -da right? These are the goals, da da da, -da even though it starts really, really great, right? A specter is haunting Europe. Uh, a specter of ha a communism. What does that mean? That means it's, it's coming. This, a specter is haunting Europe. It's only a matter of time. The internal contradictions are evident. Child labor is, is high and uh, uh, workers are discontent. Uh, this one he was writing. It's like it's only a matter of time before all of the ones are to, to fail, fail. Um, so, so what he wants to do is say, okay, well, She's theorizing that if the thing that's holding everything together is the commercial transaction and the accumulation of wealth based on the extraction of value from the worker's labor, let's take that out of the equation. If that's the economic problem, let's just slip the rug out on the knees. Let's just take that out and see what happens. If we take out the fact that we can earn, that our labor, we can be, that, that our labor power can be extracted for profit and on the basis of that buy land or or have private things. Remember, we can only have private things based on the commercial transaction. I give you X for Y, I pay, right? And eventually, at some point, you're going to have to say, well, how much? And then the whole thing starts back up again, right? We have to say, well, I'll try to do this for that. It's not a trade economy. It's going to be a capitalist economy because you're going to have to assign different levels of value, different levels of work. So you have capitalism again. So you've got to pull it out of the boundary. So he's like, well, these are the things that, that we can do, right? If we if we get rid of, of the notion of property and have things held in common, where value is held in common, if we central instead of two classes, have one common class, instead of this division of the 99% and the 1%, where almost everybody has a shitty job and only one few, what if we have, instead of two, just consolidate and centralize that into one for all, where the good of all is what's important, right? Where the good of the community, where the good of what's held in common. So how would we do that? Well, we can't have one rich guy and then 20 poor people. We need to have everything kind of shared equally and fairly and things held in common. Um, and so for that reason, we need to do all things like let's confiscate the property of da 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 da, right? We need to centralize the bank because they're held in the hands of rich monopolies. Um, and we need to kind of democratize uh, equal liability for all work. Uh, we need industrial work. We need everyone to have access, an industrial army, in other words, all workers have a right to work. We need a right to work, so we need to have jobs. Uh, we need to have different types. We need to diversify agriculture and manufacturing so there's so that there's no disconnection between only certain people have certain jobs and we need to make things more equal and 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 fair. Um, and so that's the general spirit, right? Um, and in order to do that, we're going to make sure how we're going to make people equal so that they can engage in equal jobs. Well, you can't have somebody that's very, very well trained and somebody that just doesn't know what they're doing. So we need to make sure that you have free education for everyone, right? That we need to have free and equal education for all. Um, and we certainly need to get rid of child you know, labor. That was a huge one. Um, so we need to have kind of free education, uh, things held in, in common for the good of all. Uh, we need to uh, have uh, all of the industries, including the medical industry, uh, available so that people can have access to, to uh, medical care and not just the rich. And so um, the last thing to say here is that this is not a kind of a how-to manual. Marx thought that this would just happen. It's a deterministic view of history. So let's just review this for a second, okay, to make sure we understand what, what he's saying, what the problem might be. Okay, so this is, once again, um, this is the view of historical materialism, right? 
historical materialism just marks this view of history. First, there was this primitive stage of accumulation where communism was not yet but would be, where ancient societies are just charting the land that they live in, and there's feudal societies were acquiring resources, and then we then we figure out what to do with, with those resources. And aha, industrial revolution, we make machines, we start gaining wealth, we're capitalists, and we're right about here, right? Silicon Valley, we're we're revolutionizing the means of industry. That's kind of where we're at right about now. And after that, then we start revolting, right? We start revolting. And then right after that, we'll have a period of socialism uh, in which we kind of centralize. We have to st we look to the state to be able to say, hey, we're dying. We need jobs. We need health care. This is not fair. Uh, we need to socialize because of the internal contradictions. And then you have the panacea, the long-awaited goal, which, again, he did not say specifically what it would look like. He left that open. But then you would have communism. So to be clear, remember that determinism holds that all things are caused by something else. It can't be any different than it was. It's going to happen. It's determined. Societies, it's like from birth to death, from development, from, from acorn to oak tree. It's just a developmental story. It's from child to old person. It is just the natural development of a, of a society based on looking at it from the economic standpoint. So, um, so we can see certainly in Western industrialized societies that have gone through an industrial revolution, like Western Europe, United States, and Britain, how that's the case. We certainly see that we can talk all day about Occupy Wall Street. We can certainly see how that can that has a lot of salience um, for but kind of our um, cultural situation. But what happened was that in the 20th century, um, people like Ernesto Che Guevara, his name was Ernesto, and uh, nickname for Ernesto is Che, and you just call someone in Argentine called Ernesto, you just call him Che, it's like saying Bob. Or, um, so uh, Che Guevara um, kind of came in and looked around and said, well, that's all nice and good. We have the same problem in Latin America. We have horrible working conditions. People are dying. Everyone's poor. We have a rich classes taking advantage of the poor. And we have a kind of horrible situation of disenfranchisement. But we have a, a huge problem, he says, look. Um, according to Marx, in order to get to capitalism, you had to go through industrialization. No ifs, buts, or ands. You had to go from feudalism to industrialization. It's just it's economic. It's a law-like determined thing. And so Gavad comes in and says, mm, no, that can't. That leaves a whole lot of the underdeveloped world out. Because in Latin America, you don't have the infrastructure. Because of European colonialism, you don't have the factories. You didn't have. The, the kind of industrial revolution. So then Marx would say, well, no industrial revolution. If you don't have industrialization, you don't have the conditions to create the internal contradictions in capital. And if that's the case, no revolution for you. That's really kind of what he's like. You can't have a proletarian revolution if you don't have industrialization. If you haven't industrialized, you, you won't. And so remember, this is why Stalin and Mussolini tried to go through this, like, rap. they tried to do it on the fly. They're like, well, let's industrialize really, really quick. Let's just build all of these, these factories really, really quickly and just make everything to this great ironclad industrial. No, that wasn't going to happen in order to have a revolution. So Che Guevara says, that can't be right. So he modified Marxism. He disagreed with Marx. And he said, that's just a way too deterministic view of history. He's kind of like a soft determinist. He's like, that's just way too deterministic. And it also leaves a lot of people out. What about countries or regions that haven't gone through, that don't go through industrial revolution? Do they not get to, are they not capable of, of mobilizing workers? Well, Marx would say, yeah, because you have no workers. If you don't have a factory, you have no unions. You have no workers to mobilize. And so Guevara said, wait a second. I've been traveling the countries. And I can tell you that we can mobilize, not workers, but peasants. There are plenty of people who work, but their labor just doesn't, they're working with their hands. They just, it doesn't look like what you think it looks like in the West. So what Gavada did, and this is absolutely kind of brilliant in political theory, he said, 
some modified Marxism by saying that you don't need to wait for an economic phase to develop in undeveloped regions. You don't need to develop. You don't need to wait for a proletariat class of workers, right? You can have a very kind of fleshy, intuitive, power-rousing method, the kind of rebel youth. You can kind of take up arms and say, this is wrong. This is not, or at least it's not right. Maybe it's, we can't be saying it's wrong as a value judgment. It can be uncritical. But this doesn't seem right uh, because of the existence of, you can make an argument, right? This doesn't seem right because it, of the existence of famine, death, uh, um, all of these kinds of things. And so, by any means necessary, guerrilla warfare, instead of, maybe there's no two classes because we have an industrialized and you don't have a, a middle class and a working class uh, and a capitalist class, but you don't need to have these two classes. You can just rise up. And one important difference is, Gerardo said, the thing about communism is that it tends to forget the importance of the individual. He had a much more pluralistic view of the role of the individual. Um, and uh, this is the whole concept of every heart is a revolutionary cell. Um, that, that every individual uh, can't be reduced to a commonality. And Marx agreed with that, certainly. Um, but he was so, Marx was so focused, because things were so dire, he was so focused on, on making things more equal because there was such an equality. Um, and the last thing that Guevara did is he put a renewed emphasis on education. He says the role of particularly youth today is to help wake us up from the servitude of capitalism because the thing about capitalism is that it's, it's, it's more difficult to, to fight against than, let's say, according to Guevara, according to Guevara, it's more difficult to fight against an overt oppression or forced servitude because the forces that enslave one are not seen. They work behind our backs because they're economic forces and you can't touch them. The commercial transaction is, is not as, as um, and the commodity, the pursuit of the commodity, is not something that we can easily see. And so in order to create a different nature where we don't want the things that we think we want and on the basis of that say I want, I need, but that's who I am, right? I mean think about the way that we express our individuality through different logos. You wear this brand but I wear that brand and that sort of makes us different. It makes us the same because it's still the ruling ideology I play according to Guevara. And so what we have here is that um, the educator fuses together both of these theories. It's a very Marxist theory, but it also brings together neo-Marxist philosophy through Guevara by putting the emphasis on the individual and education, right? I mean, what do the educators do, right? What are they? They are the consciousness rating. They are educating, right? Uh, by kind of doing a kind of guerrilla warfare, by any means necessary, by changing it up, by an unexpected revolt. Um, and so you have different characters, right? Um, you have Jules, and you have the things that she stands for, and we know that she's the kind of situation that Marx would have, uh, and Guevara would have emphasized with, right? She's massively in debt. Why? It doesn't make sense, right? She's incredibly in debt from a collision. You have Peter, and he kind of, um, he, he's, he's really um, drawn to ideology. He wants to watch. He wants expensive things. He wants to fight against it, but the power of ideology is very strong with him, right? He's underemployed, and you can understand. It's not unreasonable. And then you have the character of the equivalent of Che Guevara, Jan, right? He's the intellectual that's principled. He's modeled after his writings. Um, and it's really revolutionary ideals that, um, that guide him. And then you have capitalism, right? Um, and th there's something really interesting with the character of Hardenberg right at the end. We'll get to it back. But remember that, that it's not that, that it's, it's not a master puppeteer thing. It's not that there's an evil capitalist and coming in and, and articulating uh, needs of capitalism, right? Because he was once a member of the German uh, Socialist Party or the Student Union. So you have the different scenes in which you see a blend of Marxism and neo-Marxism, right? You have the concept that um, 
You have Kuhnian instances where they're just articulating Marxist revolution, right? You need to wake up from the ideology of the superstructure, from watching TV, from all of the ways in which ideology. And then you need to do a very step-by-step -step plan. You need to recognize injustice, and then you need to do something. You need to revolve, right? You need to start proletary revolution. Um, and you need to change things up by any kind of uh, any means necessary. Um, and so what I want to do for this particular kind of discussion is I want to move it open. I want to see all of the ways in which you tie these things together. There's so it's a kind of it's one of the clearest, clearest examples of Marxism and neo-Marxism um, because of the role of education, right? Marx didn't put the kind of role of education that Guevara did, the consciousness raising the young, the, the role of youth in in revealing or lifting the veil of ideology. That's the role of the educators, to lift the veil of ideology. So are they successful or not? Or is the pool of ideology too great? Does it work? Does it not? And the way that we can engage this question is the ending. How did it end, right? Uh, it was a controversial ending at first, but I want you to kind of think through and tell me what you think this signifies for Marxist theory and where we're, uh, where we're at in terms of Marxist um, conceptions of, of history. Uh, do you think it, it um, strengthens the analysis that capitalism is just kind of too strong or that uh, or, or that it does breed its internal contradictions, that it will lead to a kind of continued revolt. Um, what do you think? Discuss this in terms of the actual film analysis and the end of the movie, uh, along with any other kind of strong ties that you see to the lecture. Okay? Um, so the last thing we have is um, exam seven, and I'm going to give you 50 questions. Uh, I'm telling you, I'm going to take them kind of straight from the lecture, right? Uh, study the lecture, the PowerPoint, there'll be a few couple questions from, from the reading, make sure you've read it, and then you watch the film. Um, but for the, by and large, you're just going to be taken straight from this lecture, okay? So I hope you've enjoyed this and, and um, gave it some more thought to a kind of a subfield in value theory and social political thought, and just one tiny little branch of that, which is Marxist uh, philosophy. There's many more to study, but for that, uh, you might want to just take a philosophy class. Okay, take care.